my enormous pleasure to welcome you to the inaugural lecture of our Professor of Tax Law, uh, Salih Dagan. Uh, and it's my job to introduce the introducer. Um, <laughs> so I, it's my pleasure also to introduce uh, Ruth Mason, the Edwin S. Cohen Distinguished Professor of Law and Taxation at the University of Virginia School of Law and Director of the Virginia Center for Tax Law. Her research has been cited by the US Supreme Court and in an Advocate General Opinion for the Court of Justice of the European Union. She has many other distinctions to her name in terms of prizes, visiting professorships, and invited keynote lectures. She has served as a national reporter for the United States to the International Fiscal Association and she is a member of the American Law Institute. She is co-founder and co-host with Professor Dagan uh, of the Oxford Virginia Legal Dialogues, an online seminar series that is open to the public and dedicated to the forging of ties between tax and other legal disciplines. I understand that there is a conference which has been co being convened in combination with this amazing uh, inaugural lecture and it's entitled Taxing People the Next Hundred Years. So I'm glad I'm not going to be around for all of that hundred years, <laughs> but uh, you know, we're in good hands, I believe. So, Professor Mason. introduction, Mindy. It is my great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Tzili Dagan, uh, before her inaugural lecture. Tzili is one of the deepest thinkers working in tax policy today. Her work on tax competition and tax treaties is well known throughout the world and has been influential to a generation of tax academics. Her tax treaties myth did nothing less than upend a century of settled wisdom about the purpose and especially the effects of tax treaties. Their purpose and effect were long thought to be to reduce double taxation. But Silly replaced this paradigm with a perhaps more cynical but certainly more accurate understanding of tax treaties. Treaties accomplish a regressive revenue shift from rich, sorry, from poor to rich countries, and their other benefits mostly accrue to national tax administrations, again, of rich countries. Tax treaties myth was an incredibly auspicious start to a stellar body of work announcing, uh, addressing all manner of tax policy topics. Another strand of Tzili's work, which is probably less known to the international tax experts gathered here today, addresses individual income tax matters. I can't go deeply into these papers, but they have as their central theme the idea that our tax policy discussions are too flat. They focus too much on efficiency at the expense of other important values, such as identity and community, that could enrich our discussion of everyday tax policy decisions, such as disallowing commuting expenses or taxing imputed income or permitting transferability of charitable tax credits. Silly shows how consideration of these additional values also would enable us to use the tax system more effectively as a tool to promote well-being, people's senses of identity and community, and distributive justice. Silly is also known for her work on tax competition, and unlike so many, she does not unthinkingly criticize it. In her piece, Just Harmonization, Silly presciently challenged the received wisdom that international coordination would promote redistributive goals. Silly argued that asymmetries in bargaining power between rich and poor countries 
might result in rich countries being the primary beneficiaries of international cooperation, particularly if that cooperation took the form of harmonization. Whereas rate harmonization is commonly and recently zealously promoted as a means to protect the social welfare state from destructive tax competition that erodes tax bases and may ultimately result in a reduction of provision of public goods, Tzili took a broader perspective that included developing countries. Developing countries, she argued, may rationally prefer lower taxes that attract inbound capital investment instead of high taxes of the type needed to support the type of self, uh, social welfare programs that exist only in rich states. Because tax rate competition may favor poor states, whereas rate harmonization favors rich states, silly question whether rate harmonization should be a goal of international tax policy. That argument now seems mainstream, lo these many years later, now that everyone else has caught up to Tilly. Tilly developed and deepened the ideas of just harmonization in her award-winning book, International Tax Policy Between Competition and Cooperation. Tilly's book is both philosophical and realist. In it, she rightly conceives of the challenge of tax competition to distributive justice as involving two levels, the problem of justice between states and the problem of domestic justice. And no state should or would knowingly and willingly agree to a multilateral effort to advance justice in the world if at the same time it would compromise justice <coughs> domestic. So international cooperation is just only if it does not compromise domestic justice. In this book, Tilly sets out her view of the conditions for justice and how those conditions limit states' ability to cooperate. She also gives pragmatic suggestions for how to make competition better, less destructive, more constructive. Refreshingly, Tilly never seems to be captured by party or politics. She does not reject globalization or open markets or free movement of capital or free movement of people, nor does she reject market competition or even tax competition. That she does not fundamentally lament globalization has enabled her to be one of the most effective and clear-eyed critics of its outcomes. Silly never loses sight of the big picture. If Silly has a specialty, it's exploring how the tax system may be structured to best promote human flourishing. And you get the keen sense when reading her work that that question is never far from her mind. In short, Silly's work is brilliant, subtle, provocative, and never doctrinaire. It's my pleasure to introduce Silly. <laughs> So, thank you, Ruth, for this very over-the-top kind introduction, uh, and of course for chairing this session uh, this evening. And thanks, uh, many thanks to the Dean, uh, the Bedell, the Pro Vice Chancellor, and the Assessor for making it official. Uh, a special thanks to everyone on the faculty who made all, it all work, particularly Michelle Robb, Laura Wilding, Luke Webster, Steve Allen, and of course, thank you, Agatha Dibitz. And finally, thank you all for coming. Um, so, so when we think about tax, um, and I'm sure everybody thinks about tax, you know, all the time as I do. Um, we usually envision ourselves as a, as a group of constituents ruled by a sovereign state which is entrusted with exclusive legislative powers to tax. Through the political process, we negotiate a bundle of goods and services to be paid for by all of us. Thus, under the social contract, we entrust the state with the power to coerce us to pay taxes and to allocate the benefits and duties of the system among us 
as long as it treats us justly. Under globalization, however, many people operate beyond state borders, and their lives and activities spread across more than a single state. Not only can they relocate, but they can also reside in one jurisdiction and make use of regulatory regimes or other goods and services publicly offered by other jurisdictions. So, for example, they can subscribe to the contract laws of New York and use the UK court system by the terms of their own contracts. They can use the, the corporate governance regime of Delaware simply by incorporating there. They can enjoy the innovative regulatory environment of Singapore or use the securities regulation of the United States by trading on the US exchange. They can even adopt a child or hire a surrogate, a surrogate mother in a foreign jurisdiction when their home country does not allow that. They can study in publicly supported institutions overseas, invest in a thriving high-tech industry cultivated by public investment, or work in a, in a prosperous labor, labor market in a foreign jurisdiction where their talent or creativity is in high demand. This diversification is facilitated by the fact that under globalization, states simultaneously interact not only with their own constituents, but also with non-members. States can, of course, invite outsiders to fully join, for example, gain full membership as citizens. But they may also limit their interaction with outsiders to the provision of some of the goods and services for a fee, as in the case of incorporation fees, or provide some of the goods and services in exchange for domestically in-demand resources, such as capital in the case of foreign direct investment, talent in the case of athletes or scientists, uh, or simply positive spillovers, as in the case of research and development. So just like country clubs that can sell day passes for a fee, states can and do invite foreigners to visit, rent, invest, establish businesses in the country, trade with locals, work, study, or even get life-saving medical treatment without becoming full members. So what happens to the social contract when people operate in more than one jurisdiction? When they benefit from publicly provided goods and services in multiple states? One aspect of this multiplicity often discussed by international tax experts, focuses on which state should be able to tax them. Raising issues such as double taxation, no taxation, and more generally gaps and frictions between states taxing the regime. But the dilemmas which globalization presents for states are even more fundamental. The ability of people to relocate and to consume publicly provided goods and services of multiple jurisdictions a la carte challenges the most fundamental structure of the system. The pressures of globalization go to the very heart of the social contract. As I will argue here today, they challenge the ability of states to pursue joint projects and they challenge their ability to promote justice and thus might undermine the very legitimacy of states' authority. Now let me be clear, despite its many discontents, globalization is not the enemy here. There is no doubt that economic globalization has generated growth and prosper prosperity in unprecedented levels. It has been a boon to capital owners, but not a bad deal for many poor workers in many countries either. Even more importantly, the increased opportunities globalization brought with it, along with its checks on state power, are of utmost importance for people's liberty, allowing them to satisfy their own preferences and to pursue their own goals. And yet, the challenges it presents for the social contract are fundamental. In order to preserve states' ability to provide public goods and services which their constituents require, and to sustain the justice they deserve, we need to rethink a social contract appropriate for an era of globalization. A social contract that would ideally be able to support members' collective self-determination without rolling back the opportunities people enjoy under globalization. Now, this, of course, is a huge challenge that will require a great effort in order to resolve. My goal here today is to refine this challenge, to unpack the issues at stake and present the essential dilemmas it involves. In that, 
I turned the spotlight to people rather than multinationals in order to start a text conversation around the interaction between people and their political communities. Now, I should note, as Mindy uh, just mentioned, that this is one of the key themes of the conference we are hosting here starting tomorrow on taxing people the next 100 years. And this is also a great opportunity to welcome our guests arriving from literally five con uh, uh, continents and to thank you all for being here with us today. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so in order to unpack um, this issue, I will start with the domestic setting of a closed economy and set the floor for explaining the key features of the social contract. The public provision of goods and services, the duties of equal concern and respect, including distributive justice it entails, and the nature of membership in a political community of the state it demands. I will then zoom out to the global level and examine how the exposure to the global market affects the social contract. I will focus on two factors of globalization, mobility and fragmentation. Third, I will explain how both mobility and fragmentation shape the interaction between states and their constituents and explore the implications of these processes on the features of the social contract. Now let me give you a quick spoiler. I will argue that if left unattended, mobility and fragmentation threaten to unravel the social contract as we know it. The starting point of our discussion is the domestic arena of the state, where taxation allows states to pay for the joint projects of their people and, importantly, offers a way, some would argue the best way, to promote distributive justice, thus ensuring the legitimacy of the coercive system of the state. One way to explain this interaction is through the metaphor of the social contract. The social contract is, of course, a loaded concept in political philosophy. Here, I will use one specific conception of this social contract. The social contract is essentially a thought experiment. And under this contract, the state is entrusted with the authority to coerce the members of its political community in order to be able to provide them with goods and services of a greater scale and scope as long as it treats them all justly. Under a well-functioning fun social contract, state institutions deliver greater stability and security. They facilitate people's ability to make plans for the future with a relative assurance that such institutions will comply with their obligations and enforce the duties of others. Ideally, the institutions of the state allow members of this self-determined political community to live more fulfilling and less taxing lives. Taxation, of course, has a major role in upholding the financial aspects of this project. Through the fiscal system, uh, we entrust the state with a monopolistic power to coerce us to pay for publicly provided goods and services and to decide which goods and services will be so provided. Now, in publicly provided goods and services, I mean not only pure public goods such as law and order, but also merit goods that the state provides in fulfilling its mission of enabling and facilitating people's well-being and self-determination. So think, for example, of public health care. And also beyond those economic concepts of public and merit goods, when I refer to publicly provided goods, I also mean goods and services that would not carry the same meaning if not jointly uh, pursued. So think, for example, of public education, of public art museums, or uh, of public uh, broadcasting services. This power of the state to coerce people to pay taxes demands under the social contract that the state will not only serve our collective interests, but also be justified to all of us. Otherwise, there is no dis justification for the state's assertion of its coercive power. In other words, the authority of the state depends on its compliance with the demands of justice. To be acceptable in this way requires the law to express equal respect and concern to all its constituents. As Ronald Dworkin put it, a political community that exercises dominion over its own citizens and demands from them allegiance and obedience to its laws must take up an impartial, objective attitude towards them all. Equal concern is the special and indispensable virtue of sovereigns. 
followers of traditional tax theory may find echoes of these tenets of state authority in the requirements that taxes must not only be efficient so as to maximize welfare, they also have to be equitable. So this duty of justice has two dimensions. One dimension is horizontal. Since taxation speaks on our behalf as co-authors of the social contract, it has to treat each and every one of us with equal concern and respect. Now this, I claim, is what tax jargons of horizontal equity truly means. The taxing state is obligated to treat us not as abstract beings, but rather in, one, in, in our more robust sense of personhood, to see us as we are. The tax system must not be oblivious, for example, to the fact that the person's gender implies that her caring responsibilities are greater than others, or that her disability implies that she incurs extraordinary costs in producing income. Likewise, presumably, taxpayers who are less mobile globally should not be disadvantaged compared to those who are more mobile. The second dimension of justice is vertical. It requires the state to ensure the fair distribution of the social welfare pie. Now what exactly would be considered fair distribution for the social contract to be acceptable is of course debatable. But what is important for our purposes in, in, here today is that considerations of distributive justice must be part of any legitimate tax scheme in the domestic setting. Moreover, Unless one subscribes to, to strict libertarianism, most would agree that some level of redistribution is necessary. So tax and justice are inherently entangled in the economic project of the state. The coercive power of the state enables it to operate and, and allows for the public provision of goods. At the same time, the coercive power of the state demands justice. Justice provides the coercive power of the state with the necessary legitimacy. Thus, Taxes need not only support our collective welfare by financing public goods and services, but must also be just. Treat each of us with equal concern and respect, including being distributively just. The last feature of the, con of the social contract justification of the state is the concept of political membership. As members, we have reason to endorse and comply with the fundamental social rules, laws, and institutions of the state. So like the founding members, members of a club, a community, or a corporation who declare themselves members and thus claim their entitlement to certain rights and benefits and assume certain duties, the social contract metaphor envisions a defined group of members in the political community of the state who, by belonging to such a community, subject themselves to its duties and rights. Political membership, of course, is more than a consumer's club. Neither it is purely a purely coercive organization. <laughs> members' constituents are not merely users of the goods and services which the state provides, nor are they merely subjects of its coercive regime. Members are co-authors of the state's regime. In Nagel's terminology, they are part of a unique coercive co-authorship. Or, as Cohen and Sable explain, individuals are both subjects in law's empire and citizens in law's republic. Thus, as the famous no taxation without representation saying goes, tax is, is linked at its core to the idea of co-authorship in a political community. Members of, these, of this political community take up unique commitments to obey its rules and to support its just institutions. They are thus entitled to the goods and services which the state provides and owe their peers a duty of justice. Now these abstract maxims easily translate in the context of taxation into a duty to comply with tax rules that pursue just goals of horizontal and vertical equity. But what may seem like a straightforward analysis in the domestic setting is more complicated under globalization, where people operate beyond state borders and their lives and activities spread across more than a single jurisdiction. This is where the question of international taxation arises, how to, step, to settle a state-based regime with a competitive global reality. 
Okay, so let me now turn to analyze the effects uh, the globalization might have on the features of the social contract uh, in the tax context. For that, I would like to look at two main aspects of globalization, mobility and fragmentation. Mobility is the more familiar aspect of the two. Under globalization, people increasingly relocate in search of a place that would better serve their goals and interests. People's mobility drives and is driven by competition among states, as states are seeking to attract talented, productive, and young individuals who would contribute to their economy, to their culture, and even to their social security systems. In competing for residents in demand, states offer attractive packages of public goods and services that would cater to their needs and preferences. Now, what effect might this have on the social contract? Well, subjecting states to the supply and demand forces of competition may affect the mix, the quality, and the quantity of goods and services they offer. Fixation, of course, is part of the attraction in attaching a, a, an appealing price tag to the sought-after bundles of public goods and services. Thus, states are going to have an incentive to offer goods and services which mobile individuals find attractive and reduce their tax burdens in, in order to offer competitive quote-unquote pricing. Now let me just highlight one particular aspect of people's mobility and this would be the temporal dimension. Relocation may create temporal mismatches between the goods people consume in one state and the, and the taxes they pay in another. It is not uncommon for people who benefit from public goods in the past to later opt to reside, to incorporate, to, or produce their income elsewhere, as in the case of the brain drain. Similarly, it is not uncommon for people to retain options to come back and use the public goods and services offered by the original state, for example, their citizenship, their right to work, uh, their, eligib their eligibility for public health or old age benefits. These mismatches between the lifelong ability being taxed and the level of consumption of publicly provided goods and services interfere with states' ability to internalize the benefits from long-term public investments, such as higher education or basic science. Now, before I move to fragmentation, let me just note that today I focus on, on the mobility of sought-after individuals. There are, of course, other groups of people that are less fortunate not only they are not sought after, but oftentimes they are actively rejected by states. The discussion of their proper treatment, given the diverse reasons that motivate them and motivate, motivate countries, economic, social, political, or humanitarian, uh, implicate a different set of considerations that should thus wait for another day. Okay. So next, fragmentation. Fragmentation is a concept which is perhaps less familiar in the literature of international taxation, but it is a key feature of the system and it markedly changes the analysis. Under fragmentation, some taxpayers can, as I noted at the very start of my talk here today, unbundle the packages of goods and services offered by states and consume them a la carte. They can reside in one state, but study, invest, trade, or litigate in multiple other jurisdictions. Membership on the one hand, and day passes or permits to use the facilities on the other, represent the two poles of a spectrum of possible modes of interaction with the state. Membership represents the full subscription, entitling the holder to the full range of rights that the state provides and the duties it imposes. Day passes, by contrast, only provide a very limited right to use a given set of goods and services provided by the state. Presumably, users of a la carte such goods and services will only purchase them if the price is right. States, too, are expected I'm sorry, to offer such goods and services to occasional users only when the marginal cost of offering them is lower than the benefits they entail. Entail. Now, two key mechanisms allow this fragmentation. First, choice of law rules. The variety of these rules allows people to some leeway in selecting the rules that will apply to them, irrespective of their other coordinates. 
Second, technological capacities, which allow taxpayers to enjoy goods and services overseas. Thus, people can study online and benefit from publicly supported higher education overseas. They can work remotely and enjoy the labor market standards and sometimes the legal protection of other jurisdictions. And they can use the foreign regulated banking system, financial or insurance industries in other jurisdictions by engaging with them remotely. While some jurisdictions try to limit the application of the legal regimes to, on a territorial basis, others do not insist on such restrictions. Together, choice of law mechanisms, technological developments, as well as the temporal mismatches I discussed earlier, untie the links between people's membership in a state and the membership fees it imposes, and the consumption of goods and services provided by that state. Occasional users of a la carte services are not being taxed based on their ability to pay, and certainly not on their lifelong ability to pay. In fact, when the marginal cost of providing such goods and services are low, states, given competition, may settle for a low price or even simply the positive spillovers provided by, the, by non-residents engaging with their economy. The bottom line is that people who are able to consume publicly provided benefits overseas will often be able to purchase a superior service for a lower cost. Fragmentation does not stop here. It does not stop in offering a la carte menus. A growing number of jurisdictions offer a complementary feature that allows taxpayers not only to consume the goods and services they wish, but also not to pay for the ones they don't wish to consume. These jurisdictions offer a limited tax base for a special category of res residents, what I term as non-subscription residency options. Non-subscription options allow taxpayers to reside in jurisdictions without paying membership fees. Such individuals are not limited, of course, to consume only the public goods and services offered by their newly adopted hosts. They can combine the non-subscription status with purchasing desirable public goods and services a la carte elsewhere, and thus essentially pay only for the goods and services they wish to consume without paying subscri subscription fees anywhere. A famous example is the UK non-DOM regime. But the UK is not alone. Other countries, Italy, Malta, Israel, and others, have joined the UK in offering versions of such regimes, allowing people to reside in the country for as much as 15 years without being considered full members. These schemes allow people to effectively opt out of the entire system of, global con of, of, of social contracts and treat all states as mere providers of goods and services a la carte. If this process expands, we may no longer be able to conceptualize states as separate communities set up uh, to each collectively provide bundles of goods and services as part of the co-authored project. The borders of these communities become porous and flexible, as people can and do operate across them, either physically or virtually. In this process, sorry, if this process gains traction, states may find themselves competing with multiple regimes and competing along, margin, along multiple margins, competing for residents and their activities along both time and scope, physical as well as virtual. This hyper-competitive reality is, of course, very different than the vision of the state under the traditional story of the social contract we started from. So what is the meaning of all this for the social contract? In the time I have left, I would like to ask, how do mobility and fragmentation affect the ability of the, of the state to publicly provide goods and services, and in particular, what influence might mobility and fragmentation have on social contracts, various normative underpinnings? To do that, I will very briefly discuss the potential consequences for efficiency, for distributive justice, horizontal equity, and for civic membership. 
But first, on people's liberty. So people's liberty and self-determination are at the core of our discussion here tonight. They base both the rationale for the social contract and our basic intuition, at least my basic intuition, in supporting people's mobility and freedom to choose where and how to operate. And so my starting point is that mobility and fragmentation are essential for people's liberty. Mobility allows them to freely choose their affiliation. Fragmentation gives them a chance to seek opportunities that may be lacking where they reside without forcing them to leave and provides them with a plurality of options above and beyond what a single jurisdiction can reasonably be accept, expected to produce. Moreover, the right to exit is often the last defense against the coercive power of the government and disciplines the government to be more responsive to its constituents. On the other hand, the same exit options available for some might undermine the self-determination of others, those left behind. First, states anticipating the departure of mobile individuals may be less inclined to make long-term long investments. If states invested less in long-term goals, their ability to support the long-term plans of their people might decline. Second, long-term planning which is a key part of people's self-determination, often necessitates the ability to rely on the resources and support of fellow members. The fact that some members of the community might, might opportunistically leave may pull the rug from under the feet of those left behind. Thus, supporting unrestrict, unrestricted liberty of the mobile might undermine the ability of others in the community, those left behind, to flourish. Now, to be sure, this difficulty need not imply imposing limits on people's ability uh, to move, on people's mobility, or uh, on the right to seek opportunities elsewhere. Presumably, the solution should be to increase the opportunities available to those lacking them, rather than limit the liberty of others in the community. And yet, even if we could offer similar liberties to everyone, it is important to note that some people will not be able to benefit from them. For example, vulnerable individuals may not be able to make use of better opportunities elsewhere. And thus the seemingly equal opportunity to relocate or consume services overseas is of little or no benefit for them. Liberty thus presents a tension between the liberty of some to leave and the concern of opportunistic behavior limiting the ability of others to rely on the, on the institutions, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, of the social contract. Next, let me turn to the efficient public provision of goods and services. Mobility and fragmentation can certainly have some positive effects on the efficiency of publicly provided goods and services. Consider mobility first. As the Tibu model explained, people's voting with their feet provides information that helps bridge the gap between taxpayers' preferences and the kinds and levels of public goods su su supplied I'm sorry, by governments. Under the Tibu model, when perfect mobility exists, citizens can select among the bundles of public goods and services offered by various jurisdictions with tax price attached. Such a selection process, though not perfect, increases taxpayers' preference satisfaction. The pressure of competing for residents further helps in setting a more efficient provision of public goods and services. Fragmentation pushes this consumeristic logic of taboo to, ex to its extreme. The ability to pick and choose unbundled goods and services offers more nuanced choices and further increases preference <laughs> satisfaction, where taxpayers can better tailor the goods and services they consume to their own preferences. This could also provide governments with more refined information as to the demand for specific goods and services and allow them to specialize in areas for which demand is high and where the comparative advantage lies. That said, Globalization may entail considerable inefficiencies. 
First are the usual critiques raised against imperfect market, uh, the imperfect market of tax competition. So imperfect mobility, a race to the bottom, externalities, free riding, and tax avoidance techniques all play a role in undermining such efficiency. But even absent these market failures, some publicly provided goods might be undersupplied as their efficient provision requires some scale. If too many people opt for a non-subscription option, some states may be unable to provide large-scale projects. The bottom line regarding the efficiency effects of mobility and fragmentation, and especially non-subscription options, are inconclusive. On the one hand, mobility and fragmentation may improve preference satisfaction and efficient production of goods and services by states. On the other hand, market imperfections and a bias against large-scale projects undermine the efficiency of publicly provided goods and services. Third, distributive justice. So mobility applies competitive pressure on states to reduce their taxes and thus limits the resources available for redistribution. Moreover, when some people are more mobile than others, states have an incentive to price discriminate among taxpayers, to offer attractive tax deals to mobile and desirable taxpayers, so for the talented, the young, and importantly for, for our purposes, the wealthy ones. Hence, not only do states' funds might shrink due to tax competition, but the allocation of the tax burden might change in favor of in-demand taxpayers, which are often precisely the taxpayers which states need to tax more in order to redistribute income. Similarly, the goods and services which states offer may be tilted in favor of more attractive taxpayers in an effort to retain them or attract new ones and the quality and quantity of goods and services which such in-demand individuals are not particularly interested in, think welfare, may decline. The introduction of a la carte consumption and especially non-subscription regimes applies even greater pressure to the ability of, of states to use the tax system to reduce inequality. When individuals are tempted to relocate to non-DOM regimes, they can pay no membership fees, and thus the services they don't wish to consume lack funding. This further limits what the state has to offer for those left behind. Thus, jurisdictions that provide such non-subscription options to wealthy foreign individuals denigrate the social contract in other jurisdictions. If such arrangements become prevalent, the ability of all states to promote distributive justice through the tax system might deteriorate. Fourth, horizontal equity. So recall that horizontal equity demands that the state treats us not as abstract beings, but rather to see us as we are. The global competitive scene, however, may alter states' perspectives as states are increasingly pushed to think like firms. Under mobility, states increasingly tend to pursue valuable taxpayers and seek out those who are more inclined to relocate for superior deals of public goods and lower taxes. Unfortunately, they might invest less effort in retaining members who have no realistic option to move or uh, those that other countries find them less attractive. Treating some individuals differently simply because they, like, un unlike others, have better options out there, highlights their use value instead of seeing them as equal members in a political community who deserve equal concern. This is even worse in the case where people in less demand are also part of an otherwise disadvantaged group, such as the case in many, with many vulnerable groups. Unlike mobility, however, Fragmentation, by allowing constituents to consume additional publicly provided goods and services a la carte overseas, does not seem to undermine horizontal equity. After all, as long as they pay their taxes at home, 
the governments can still finance the bundles of public goods and services that would accommodate the needs of others in the community. Indeed, one may argue that the ability of constituents to consume a variety of goods and services a la carte in multiple jurisdictions may even help in catering to some specific needs and in alleviating certain inequalities where their home jurisdictions fail to provide them. Thus, for example, where domestic institutions may not have the resources to make higher education accessible for people with disabilities, foreign institutions may serve as a viable alternative. However, as before, it is important to note that the ability to pick and choose publicly provided goods and services in itself is not allocated equally among people. Such ability often demands economic and social resources that not everyone enjoys. Hence, when states leverage on other jurisdictions to accommodate some of the constituents' needs, they may undermine equal treatment of those within their community that do not have access to such foreign jurisdictions when such services are essential for people's self-determination. And last on my list, is uh, civic membership in a political community. Mobility and fragmentation have a mixed effect on civic membership. The exit option they provide is of course key in supporting such membership. As Albert Hirschman has taught us, the power of exit keeps a healthy check on the power of the majority. Where people's political voice fails to be heard, their exit power is, amplifies it making governments more responsive to the voice of the people. But people do not all enjoy exit options, sorry, equal exit options. Because states try to attract or ret retain them, people with better exit options get greater influence over the design of the social contract. Putting it, bl putting it bluntly, where people's exit power declines, their voice may count less. Thus, to a great ex extent, exit prevails over voice, which limits the ability of the community to pursue its collective goals. Moreover, the emphasis on individual members' preferences downplays the significance of collective decision-making. Fragmentation helps them attend to their individual needs separately from their co-constituents, and mobility provides them with the security of being able to join another political community in case their home country fails. Moreover, as is often the case with market norm, when market norms infiltrate other spheres, members may be more inclined to view such public goods and services as mere commodities, satisfying their preferences irrespective of who provides them or who else is entitled to them? And finally, in providing many available options for people to select from, mobility and fragmentation make people's com commitment to their community tentative. At any given moment, they can opt out. Now this, of course, supports the liberty of those who can so choose. At the same time, it can also encourage opportunistic exit, which may provide harmful I'm sorry, which may prove harmful for civic membership. Members' long-term commitment is crucial for them to be able to co-author and support the collective self-determination, reinforce their sense of belonging, and thus, for many, to sustain parts of their personhood. The constant concern over potential opportunistic <coughs> moves by others undermines this. This however, is only one side of the equation, as the existence of a viable option to leave is not only crucial for people's liberty, but may also make staying more valuable, making the decision to be a part of their community a choice rather than mere default. To be sure, the asymmetry between mobile and immobile individuals is troubling. But as before, the problem is not the existence of exit <coughs> options, but rather the distribution. If the choice to leave and the choice to consume elsewhere were equally allocated among members of society, 
And if we could protect people from opportunistic behavior of others, mobility and fragmentation as such would not present a serious problem for civic membership. As before, it is important to note that some people, for example, vulnerable individuals, will not be able to benefit from exit options even if granted to them. So let me summarize this part. We have seen that the benefits of mobility and fragmentation, and we have seen the difficulties they raise through all these normative dimensions. <clears throat> the bottom line is that there is a fine line to thread between the advantages and disadvantages of mobility and fragmentation for liberty, for civic membership, for efficiency, and for justice. Free movement and the av availability of a la carte options are key for people's liberty, as well as for a thriving political community. The risk lies where a certain threshold is crossed so that a completely marketized and fragmented competition undermines the very existence of political communities and thus of civic membership. Now notice that throughout this discussion, we've seen two recurring challenges. First, how do we settle the asymmetry between those who benefit from mobility and fragmentation and those who cannot? And second, how do we do this? How do we settle this asymmetry without undermining people's liberty and their opportunities to pursue their own goals? Now, this seems to be an inherently irreconcilable clash between two deep normative commitments. To put individuals first, or to put their commitment to others first. But this is exactly where we often come to tax law for solutions. Taxes are exactly the mechanism that may help us care for those who cannot make use of greater liberties without barring people from doing what they wish to do. This, in fact, is the essence of the financial aspects of the social contract. Collect taxes from those with greater abilities in order to publicly provide goods and services for everyone, including those with lesser such abilities. What makes tax unique is that it is the one legal instrument that allows us to collectively discharge of our duties towards the have-nots without instructing people what they should or should not do. Mobility and fragmentation present an additional rift in society that demands our attention. A rift which, like other categories of inequality that are relevant for tax purposes, presents us with features that need to be addressed by tax law. So the problem, I hope, is clear. But I'm afraid that the solutions are hardly as easy to discern. Indeed, as I hinted from the start, I will not purport to offer concrete solutions here today. This, I'm afraid, is a task for another day. What makes this task especially cumbersome is the fact that it demands us to resolve not only the rifts within society, but also to settle the issues among uh, different countries. Some states can unilaterally tackle this challenge. States that are attractive enough with a constituency that is loyal enough and a membership regime that is sticky enough can probably enforce personal-based taxation membership fees as the vast majority of their constituents are unlikely to opt out for tax reasons. Thus, states in greater demands can presumably unilaterally stick to a relatively robust social contract by mandating full subscription taxes imposed on members' ability to pay. In sharp contrast, unfortunately, states with less of a draw, ones whose constituency is more elastic and their membership easier to shake off, might be less resilient and thus continuously threatened by losing their strongest taxpayers. Especially if the non-subscription options become prevalent, such states might be pushed to offer increasingly thinner levels of public goods and services to the extent that the least attractive among them become no more than nominal clubs. 
with only a very thin layer of publicly offered goods and services, without a significant ability to address distributive in injustices, and thus with an impoverished version of civic membership. Resolving these interstate asymmetries demands cooperation of unprecedented levels and raises some serious uh, questions as to the scope of global justice. As someone who has predicted that the global uh, cooperative accord on international taxation is unattainable only a couple of years prior to the signing of a multilateral pact on corporate taxation by no less than 140 jurisdictions, <laughs> I will not risk making predictions here today. <laughs> but let me just say what I think is still true even in the case of the current corporate tax regime that the conditions necessary for such a global pact on individual taxation not only to be signed but to be equitable are such that its attainment would be nothing short of a small miracle. Please rise.